Joining me tonight is Thomas Joseph Brown, an independent researcher into spiritual science and metaphysics, as well as light and color, free energy, law sciences, electrotherapeutics, and more. He was director of Borderland Sciences Research Foundation from 1985 to 1995. What a show we have for you tonight. We're going to be talking about a little bit about everything. How's that? Uh, without further ado, welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from New Zealand. Oh, well, thank you, Hillary. Really appreciate you asking me on, and uh, I look forward to a good conversation. Well, that's what I'm hoping we have, too. And, boy, when I was going through your uh bio, if you will, on thomasbrown.org, I was quite taken, and I said, well, if I can't have an interesting conversation with this man, I might as well wrap it up and go home. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, I love good conversation. That's how um, the mind has to remain active. Well, how do you how do you do it? I mean, I, I look I look and I'm, listeners are probably at a loss now for what I'm talking about here because I'm kind of flabbergasted looking over this and saying, "Gosh, how am I going to introduce this man? He's he's a little bit of everything I've ever wanted to talk about up to the 43 years of my life." On this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks like, you tell, them, tell them who you are, a little bit about your background, where you come from, uh, because honestly, I think, Tom, for the first time in 11 years, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> oh, f- well, thank you. Um, yeah, well, basically, I'm an uh, old Chicago boy, grew up um, highly educated parents, you know, university professors, but um, I sort of went my own way, dropped out of school and wandered about and um, in- ended up out in the desert praying and ended up in an Indian camp and learning a lot of different things. And in the process, I ended up uh, running Borderland Sciences in 1985, which was an old research foundation that was started in 1945 by a man named Mead Lane. Um, And it was, I say, the oldest UFO research organization on the planet outside the Vatican. but by the time I took it over, we tried to get more into the practical side of metaphysics, actual functional uh, approaches. You know, in the earlier days, you know, there was a lot of channeling, and which I respect. You know, people should should you know be happy with whatever information they get from anywhere. But I was interested in the engineerable reality. What are the true pathways? My background of study was in you know wide range of different things, but always things like the Tibetan Book of the Dead. You know, I was aware from young, I saw old people dying, grandparents and things. I go, well, you just passed through. What else is there? So I just want to know. I want to know everything. And what I found in the process is you can't know everything, but you can know where everything you know fits in your mind. You know, this is the process of the theory of knowledge, which I learned through, um, like, Rudolf Steiner's work. So I guess... Yeah, in general, people say, well, what do you do? And I go, I goof off. And they go, that must be fun. I go, yeah, but it doesn't pay very well. Uh, <laughs> so I try to read everything. I try to keep an open mind. Um, I've been very fortunate in meeting a lot of very interesting people around the world um, over the years. And, um, and I always, I'd meet old people, and I'd say, what's the coolest thing you ever heard? Or, you know, <laughs> find out. Learn from experience, learn from others. So, um, yeah, I guess I hope that was a good introduction. <laughs> well, thanks for doing my job for me. It makes my job easier. <laughs> Uh, I I do want to mention to listeners as they are uh, following along with us tonight, they can go to your website, thomasbrown.org. You have written four books, uh, Loom of the Future, Weather Engineering Work of Trevor Constable, which we'll be discussing a little bit tonight, Uh, the Ellie Eman Report, The Pioneering Years of Biocircuitry, the La, how do I say this, the Lakowski, Multiple Waves, Lakowski, Multiple Wave Oscillator Handbook, and the People before with author Gary Cook, um, so you have a, you have a wide wide uh, plethora of subjects that we can talk about, and you know so we don't drag this into a three hour show and drive everybody at a cheap radio crazy. Um, I'd love to pick the topics. Now you recently released a very interesting uh, video 
called Working of the Stars and Earthly Substances. Why don't we start there? Give us a little bit of background about what this uh, video is all about. The link, by the way, for people listening is on my Achieve Radio host page right here. Uh, you can go to it and check it out and maybe follow along on some of the images. Or you know, We're not going to go slide by slide here, but he's going to give us kind of a quick rundown on what it's about. And I'd like to get into this because this is really fascinating stuff. Okay, well, yeah, it's fascinating. It's still fascinating to me. I, I came across this, um, basically how I got into the, that aspect of the work, which comes out of the anthroposophical sciences, or what we can call the Biological Institute, or the Natural Scientific Section of Rudolf Steiner's Gertianum. And this was when I took over Borderlands, uh, I encountered Trevor Constable, who was a weather engineer who had sort of combined Rudolf Steiner's work with Wilhelm Reich's work to create little geometric devices to access the ether, and he could make it rain over vast areas just with little tiny pieces of plastic. It was just absolutely amazing. And he sort of plowed me into Steiner, as he put it. So I started looking into the uh, work of the Gertianum, and one of the first things I found was Lily Kalisko's work. And she was tasked by Rudolf Steiner to show a linkage between the noble metals and the seven luminary planets of old you know in alchemy they would say gold in the sun silver in the moon venus copper iron mars that sounds great you, know, you can believe it or not um they wanted proof so what lily did is she started out she actually did 40 years of experiments of crystallizing metallic salts during planetary positions um very very german in her approach to it um, which is great because there's so much work to draw from. So, um, in essence, what you find is in this video, this was her first book, which I narrated just to preserve it and do the pictures and just make it a nice, easy presentation. As she shows that the different, like silver nitrate is related to the moon, iron is iron sulfate would be related to Mars. So she mixes them, they get certain patterns, and then they mix in lead, which by itself doesn't create a crystal picture. But when they mix that with the other ones, it changes the whole character. So in the process of these experiments, in 1926, there was a conjunction of the Sun and Saturn coming up. So Lily uh, thought that there was um, that this would actually increase the lead characteristics in the crystallization patterns. So she did crystallizations during it, but what she found was is when the sun was in front of Saturn, the lead wouldn't crystallize. There was like no effect whatsoever, which it takes a while to absorb the import of that. Now, her next book, which I'm actually looking at, I'm actually setting up now to photograph the plates out of, and I will make a video out of that, uh, Gold in the Sun. And what that is is it's a little easier for people to understand and that is, is um, she was doing gold crystallization during a solar eclipse. And what she showed is when the moon moves in front of the sun, gold will not crystallize properly. Because the gold... No, you're talking about literal. This is a literal experiment where the, the crystallization of these literal minerals will not crystallize when these certain planets are in position, correct? I just want to make sure, yeah. you know, because I'm not going to pretend I know all of what you're talking about here, and I know people are following along going, does he mean this you know, literally, or does he mean this, like, kind of, you know, sometimes people have a hard time connecting, like, astrology, for example, and all of this stuff that they hear in that with the literal, you know, positions of the planet. So we're talking about a literal position of the sun in front of Saturn or the moon in front of the sun, and these experiments are happening, and they're responding accordingly, correct? Absolutely correct, yes. This is real world. Um you know, that was my mentor, Trevor Constable, who I mentioned. Right? His uh, motto was, only results count. You know, he says, you, know, you, you can get a library filled with what people think about things and what they believe. He says, but what can you verify? So I followed the trail of what was verifiable in the metaphysical sense. So really, that's the basis of my work and research. So, yes, this is true. Um, and. So we don't say gold won't crystallize. What we'll say is it crystallizes in an inferior form, like the the crystal, the the patterns just don't come up. So if we look, you know, people say, well, like the Greeks, they came up with like the concept of the atom, but really, the, their concept of the atom wasn't that you could 
go down to like what we think today. You got these little like spinning balls of matter that don't really exist, whether you're measuring them or not, or whatever the funny way the quantum physicists look at it. That isn't what the Greeks were thinking in Adam. What they thought was the smallest piece of gold that you could get, it still retained what they would consider the atom of gold. That atom of gold on Earth was in gold, but in the sky, in the macrocosmic, under the as above, so below doctrine, is the sun. Huh. So, so th this doesn't really fit like the heliocentric model. It doesn't mean the heliocentric model is invalid. What it means is there's some higher order functions in the universe. You know, we can go into the, like the, you know, quantum states, the submolecular, and we know that there's certain forces and functions. You know, these things are engineerable and understandable. I believe that what this sort of work shows is these things are actually happening macrocosmically as well. And that, um, you know, we, basically the approach that our materialistic consciousness takes doesn't really allow us to perceive it. You know, it's like this video I just did. You can't explain it in a sound bite. You have to sit there and think about it. And when you think about it and you start understanding it, it actually changes your consciousness. It creates a psychedelic effect in the mind, which opens it up to new ideas. So it's well, that's why I struggled so hard. I said, how am I going to do the show? I'm reading your show, <laughs> and I'm watching your videos, and, I, and I'm, I'm just absolutely in love with your work, and I'm reading through it, and I'm going, well, I don't know how I'm going to put this into form, in the form of a show, except to just let him talk and, and go and, and flow and, and just deliver it. Um, I have a question for you. As, a, as you're talking about the crystallization of these minerals, did she do it with water by any chance? She did it with both water and uh, acid solutions, depending on the mineral and the experiment. This initial um, video I did, the workings of the stars, that was with um, metallic salts in water and then basically allowed to crystallize on blotter paper. And that's where she creates what she calls the pictures, or Steigbild was the German name she had for them. Um, so, yeah, it's basically water. Well, what this actually shows, the importance of this is the, the minerals, when they're in their solid state, or the metals, they're um, under the gravity's force, you know, earth force. But when they're in suspension, then they're connected to the cosmos. That's where they relate. Now, look at our bodies. You know, we're, we're liquid, filled with all these trace elements. You know, and these elements are certainly operating differently depending on where the planetary positions are. So fundamentally what we have here is, we could say, further um, confirmation of, the, of astrology as a science. Although there's different takes on astrology because the astrologists from the Rudolf Steiner's camp in general are what we call sidereal-ists, right? The true positions, not the, the tropical positions of the modern time which are out of phase with the universe. Well, I'm curious if you are familiar with uh, Dr. Masaru Emoto's work where he photographed the crystallized water molecules uh, according to prayer. Yes, it's fascinating work. Um, and it actually, there was earlier work here, which I have an old book sitting around, uh, Man, Minerals, and Masters by Charles W. Littlefield. And he was doing similar work with uh, crystallization of uh, uh different minerals back in like the 1920s or 1930s the same sort of work this is really new work this is this is work that's been around and people have been working in it and you know when you were talking about the planets and the mineral uh, crystallizations i was thinking of dr marcus uh, emoto's work and how our bodies are mostly water and how we might be affected therefore in the same way as her experiments uh you know when certain certain times when certain constellations are in effect where we might be at you know more optimum kind of operating systems because our bodies are able to crystallize the minerals properly but then it brings up the obvious question of what if we're not you know our nutrition is so depleted and our mineralization is so depleted that we don't actually have what we're what we should be having how that would affect consciousness what are your thoughts no absolutely uh, actually that's a very lucid point to bring up thank you and we need to add on to that the uh, electrification of the planet 
you know, um, th- these fields were just to- totally immersed in artificial disruptive fields is to almost be insane. And yes, the food's devitalized. Um, basically, we're kind of in like the dying throes. You know, the whole era 2012, you know, people thought the whole 2012 thing was just like some point on a line and it didn't happen, so they forgot about it. But we're still in the middle of this big galactic transformation um, of energetic changes happening all throughout the solar system. And it's not, that's not over yet. And I guess what Steiner pointed out, it, this is the time, right? It's kind of the, the beginning of the age of the intellectual soul as he called it, you know, we need to um, basically reawaken our bodies and reconnect from the inside out because we're no longer getting fed from the outside in. So it's this new stage in the process of our own development, um, which I could probably lecture on if I had a whiteboard, but it'd probably be too complex to show the whole pattern. But there's a general flow. Um, and, no, you're right, the nutrition is absolutely terrible, you know, but I think that a lot of it, a lot of the people being born today aren't conscious souls. They're just sort of um, emergence from the elemental seas. Rudolf Steiner mentioned one thing, that part of the task of our civilization was to um, mine a lot of the minerals to release the elementals, he said, so that they could begin their path towards conscious evolution. So, so if you look at things like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, really what they're showing in there is the connections of the different elemental sections in the body. You know, if you strip back all the um, sort of cultural and uh, spiritual masks off things, you're just dealing with fundamental uh, relationships of energetic patterns. And in that sense, if your elemental centers aren't coordinated within your body, you don't really have a conscious soul. When you die, the elemental things can go back in. Some might, you know, lower ones, a few of them might be linked. But until all four of them are linked, then the heart and mind don't function together and you don't have a conscious evolving soul. So just because you see a human doesn't mean that they've got an active soul operating. They're just sort of new elementals coming into being for the next precessional round. You know, where some of well, us, we're getting ready to jump off. We've had it. <laughs> I'm out of here after this one. <laughs> it's funny that you should say that because I was just, you know, in preparation for this show, I was doing some thinking, and I said, you know, it's we used to have pyramids and all these beautiful structures, and now we have Walmarts. Mm. So it's kind of, is it, is it evolution really, or has it been a, a form of de-evolution in some senses? And I think when we really look at that and our, what we worship now uh, versus perhaps what our ancestors have, we really have quite a contrast, if you, you, if you would, because uh, we just don't do it the way they used to do it. And I think it really, it, it really solves the yearning, the seeking that, that most people feel, this deep yearn, this deep seeking type uh, energy because they they don't have that depth that they biologically cellularly remember having uh, and they're looking for it and it's hard to find nowadays because we've become such a materialistic superficial, I call it the Kardashian superficiality uh, <laughs> type, of, type of culture and it's funny you're in New Zealand and you laugh at that because I think most people assume that Kim Kardashian is an American phenomenon, nobody really knows who she is outside the country which I think is funny but it's true um, and so we have this longing, this seeking, this quest that we all feel, and you know we we equate it to the 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 soul seeking its its you know purpose and so on. And you can give it a million names, but we really have devolved. We've gone from pyramid cultures, which clearly shows a higher level of understanding and consciousness, to the culture of WalMarts and the culture of McDonald's and the culture of uh, you know the shopping malls and so on and so forth. And we've gotten away from nature. So I felt compelled to bring you on the show to talk about some of this more fundamental alchemical type workings because I believe this is really part of a lost science that not too many people understand, but yet we can intuitively connect to still, even if we don't understand it. Um, so how did how did you, could you share a little bit about your story? Uh, you say you've always been called to this work and you've always, but was there ever a point in your life when there was a substantial shift? 
shift in awareness of what you were doing in this work? Oh, uh, definitely. There, there was actually a couple of them, um, internal ones and out external ones. Um, I suppose probably the most profound one in the external for me was is when I took over Borderlands, um, and the reason I'd actually done it because it had been it had been around since 1945, and the old guy that was running it, Riley Crabb, one of the most incredibly well-read people I've ever met, um, and he used to lecture on like. Um, flying saucers and um the kabbalah things like that you know just um so i was just actually trying to like buy up all copies of all his old lectures and books before he died you know i had no intention of taking over borderland um but anyway it just sort of fell into my lap the way things went and then i met trevor constable and he he put me on to steiner who i'd always thought was a uh, christian mystic i mean i read everything from you know crowley to the vajrayana you know through my teenage and 20 years um which had to do i mean the vajrayana actually activated a lot of things in my inner consciousness um but then at borderlands the thing that really got me was learning about goethe's theory of color i mean i, I thought i knew everything and i'd read all these books on physics and stuff and then all of a sudden i realized i didn't know anything that a lot of my fundamental premises were in error and i could actually demonstrate it in like 10 minutes with a prism that that the whole concept of the electromagnetic spectrum is actually incorrect but yet a whole edifice of modern science and modern thought is built on this um so yeah so that's really what set me down this path i'm going wow if these guys are into this what else are they into oh lily calisco look at this stuff and um you know, and there was work too, like you were talking about Emoto, and there was um, uh, Theodore Schwenk. He was the man. He wrote Sensitive Chaos, did, did a lot of research on water, developed the water drop method, which is you have to go look that up. But too much to explain on the quality of water. You can actually tell the quality of water by the way drops drop into like a glycerin base. You know, the vital water has beautiful pictures, and like water, you know, like LA tap water will come out like dead. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. But he did ex- experiments where he would take, like, water and he would, like, homeopathically do succussion. But he would just use pure water, but he would do it at different times depending on astrological um, sort of uh, relationships that were either favorable to plant growth or detrimental to plant growth. You know, like you go along with, like, moon planting and stuff like that so he actually tried to put that into water and put it on plants and found the effects on plants so i suppose yeah the simple answer is i just found this um that there actually was this profound science sitting at the sides that took sort of a higher order thought process to understand but once you understood it you couldn't believe people were believing the regular stuff you're going oh wait a minute this stuff's very clear but it requires a shift of consciousness so what I try what I try to do in my work is and these videos I'm doing now these are just sort of um I've not really called it my main work I'm just trying to put a few things out get used to the technology the real purpose I'm doing I did one video called Dorje Blessing D O R J E Blessing which Dorje is the Tibetan ritual instrument and in there I started working on the techniques that I really want to do which is actually like you're talking about people, you know, in the past, the pyramid cultures, we had the cathedrals and all that. Now what do people have? Well, we've got all of that inside of us. How do you trigger it? So I've searched for that symbolic language, and that's what I'm working into um, a much grander video project. So the so symbolic that- language, could you give us a glimpse into what that is in relation to what you were just speaking of? Oh, certainly. Um yeah, well, actually, I did a video called Quaternity, which is linked on my website. Um, and I actually start, that's a preliminary excursion into these sort of archetypal symbols. So we have, I've taken two sets, and we have element and ether working together. So the elements, there's all different ones. You know, there's the medieval alchemical ones, and then they get the platonic solid forms of the elements. The ones I took are what's called the tatvas, which are the old Vedic um, ones, which are really kind of the true colors and forms of the chakras, or at least the first four, which is like yellow square for earth, silver crescent for water, blue circle for air, and red triangle for fire. 
And then you have the ethers, which comes out of natural observations using like Goethe's method of observation as taught by Steiner. And then you see you have the warmth ether, which is sort of like red radiating circles, light ether, which is sort of like yellow triangular or raying the tone or chemical ether, which is like vortexian, like that's you know, where the vortexian energy comes from. And then the life ether, which is sort of uh, a violet crystallization sort of force. And out of this, um, yeah, sort of developed a symbolic language and how they work together. So the real work I'm doing and what I want to do before I die, which I hope is a long time in the future, but um, n n not the work, but dying, is I've actually <laughs> been able to <laughs> get this stuff out right. I've actually been able to merge the, the Eastern and Western systems symbolically, the Vajrayana Mandala of the Dhyani Buddhas, which I show in my Dorje Blessing video, which I just call, that's the old school tracks. I'm just showing how that works from their perspective. But I've been able to merge that with Steiner's etheric sciences into an inner outer functional process that works with everything, prismatic phenomena, atmospheric color formation, you know, function and structure of the body through like uh, Din Shagadiali spectrochrome system, if you're familiar with that color healing system. So I've tried to find, like I say, a symbolic language that actually relates to everything. I, you know, I, I don't have to believe anything anybody told me. I can go a priori and derive this from nature again with the right state of consciousness. You know, I don't well, have to. That's an interesting statement, uh, considering biodynamic farming is a phenomena that a lot of people aren't aware of. How does how does you know that? coincide with what you're talking about you know planting to the moon cycles and and are we really talking about a renaissance of coming back to the human body and its connection to nature is nature the answer here when we go back to her and we meditate with her and we we get back into her we're so cut off in our electronic worlds and our houses and cubicles and all the things that we do um do you see that that nature is really what brings it all back because all the great things Thinkers, all the great philosophers, all the ones that really have reached outside of modern orthodox consciousness, you know, really end up saying that nature is part of that key that unlocks that door. Do you agree? Uh, absolutely. To the highest degree. I'm a, I'm a Goethean, right? I follow Goethe's work, both in optics, but also in his plant metamorphoses. And now in his plant metamorphoses, he spoke of what they called the archetypal plant. Now, the archetypal plant, um, if, you, if you're not familiar with plant morphology, you know, most people think, well, what's a plant? You know, you see something growing outside, you know, tree, flower, this or that. But the plants go through four fundamental stages, you know, from seed to flower. And they're not like this, the leaf doesn't sort of like half grow off a stem. I mean, it doesn't, and then eventually becomes a leaf. It's like the stem actually grows to a certain stage, stops for a moment, then the leaf pops out. It's completely different. It's a metamorphosis of the stem organ, right? And, and then eventually it reaches a stage where it flowers, fruits, seeds. But what Goethe found in his sort of higher order cognitive observations of this is that there is only one plant, and that's the surface, vegetative surface of the planet. And it's many manifold forms depending on you know, wide variety of factors. But where is the archetypal plant? Is it just something you can think up? Um, or, you know, he had arguments with Schiller over this and stuff. But what's interesting is, is I'm reading a book called uh, Cosmological Botany, Planetary Influences Upon Plants by uh, Ernst Michael Kranich. And he actually shows that the formations, the forms of plants are directly related to the planetary motions as a, they appear from Earth. Just like Lily Kalisco's crystallization stuff, actually, the metals react to the way the plants are moving as they appear from Earth. So, you know, we can say that, um, you know, like in the dicotyledons, which are basically seeds that have, um, you know, like corns, like monocotyledon, right? It's got one thing, but it beans a die, right? Because it splits out. It's got two pieces. That's all that, that means is, but in the dicotyledons, there's two basic mathematics of the stem, of the, you know, little petioles or things that shoot out the leaves coming off it. 
Now, those those two basic things relate exactly to the uh, Mercury Sun, either the synodic and the sidereal cycles. And of course, there's other reasons for tying that in with um, I'm sorry, with Venus, you know, <clears throat> Sun and Venus. So what you find is nature is this great teacher. It's a greater teacher than anyone could imagine. You know, rather than trying to take these things apart and seeing what's in there, like genes and all that, how about these great formative forces that are actually forming them? That's why I say there's this whole higher order science here that um, it's very hard to find anything. If you go search for cosmological botany on the Internet, you can't find anything. You find that book by Cranich. There's stuff in German, but, you know, that's why I like stuff you can't find on the Internet. Then you know you're on to something good. <laughs> <laughs> are, you familiar, are you familiar with the Voynich Manuscript? I am. Yeah, I had a friend that was really, Mike Thoreau, who worked at Borderlands with me. He was really into that, uh, wrote some, wrote up on it. Because um, then he has all those weird plants that don't exist, right? Well, they have some plants. I went to Yale and studied it, actually. I've been working with it. I photographed it myself in person back ah. in 2000. Thirteen, and I've been studying the images since I did that, and I must say that everything you just described pretty much hit it on the head. <coughs> um, I'm curious if you have thought about the GMO phenomena and the archetype of plants from that perspective. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like this dark force is disrupting. Um, yeah, like a black road is coming in from the dark side. You know, um, it's pervading all through. It's the archetype of the time. We see it in the way we generate power, the fact that we got, like, you know, worthless private imaginative currency, <laughs> and the manipulating the molecules to disrupt them into mutations. That's all part of it. You know, that's, um, yeah. But it's, no, it's interesting that you've been into that Voynich manuscript. I've, I've read a lot on it years ago, but I haven't looked into it. But it brought to mind... Um, the proto-surrealist um, Odilon Redon. I don't know if you're familiar with his art, but he painted no. all these beautiful. Yeah, he painted all these beautiful flowers, but they didn't exist. <laughs> he just made them up. Um, so. Well, interestingly they, enough, in the in the Voynich manuscript, Tom is uh, the cannabis plant. And there are a couple other plants that they have identified, or some people have put together and said that this might be this, but it's very clearly the cannabis plant, and it's a female cannabis plant in the Voynich. Um, and so some people are, you know, saying that the cannabis plant uh, is a, an extremely valuable medicine plant, medicinal plant, and some of the recipes in the Voynich manuscript, when you get to that section where they are putting together these uh, recipes which clearly are formulas if you will and uh, show these star charts and, and I really think that they're talking about how the time to gather them, the time to you know how to prepare them put them into useful ointments and medicinal purposes and so I have to say that, that one of the plants in that manuscript because most of them are unidentifiable and they've had botanists from all over the world look at it uh, one of them is the cannabis plant so it's very relevant that we're going through this big you know reform movement kind of uh, like prohibition with alcohol I think it, it, we'll see it happen in some point in our life where we allow that plant the only thing is is you touched on this very much I believe we do have a dark force moving through. Uh, the GMO archetype feels so much like that. And I think that that same kind of force is going into synthetics. Uh, you know, they're kind of, Marlboro is, has warehouses ready to go and mass produce these kind of synthetic cannabis plants. I think we're being warned by people who lived long, long ago and, you know, was working, was working with these plants in a, in a different, much, much different way to be careful with this kind of mass manipulation and such. So I, I, I just wanted to throw that in there because I found that fascinating as I was looking looking through the Voynich and, and, you know, reading it. I came to that picture and I said, well, I had seen it online, but it was a different thing to see it in person. And mm. then to photograph some subtleties that are actually in the manuscript that do not show up on even the PDF download on Yale's website itself. There's some nuances in the illustrations that are so vague and kind of worn that you really can't see it on some of the PDF downloads. But I was able to photograph it. And so it was, it was really interesting to see 
how they portrayed the cannabis plant as almost like a queen, like a dragon queen type phenomena. And I, an archetype hits it right on the head. So, mm. uh, yeah, if you if you could elaborate a little bit more about this, what you see is this dark force of the GMO archetype, because I really feel very strongly that this will be one of the biggest uh, dilemmas that humanity will face in the coming generations, because I think GMOs trigger all kinds of different genetic mutations in the human body, and we're starting to see that come out in generations as uh, we, we become one giant kind of experiment. Oh, we have. It's almost like, you know, we're in some sort of uh, dark alchemical phase, you know, um, maybe not correlative to the uh, traditional alchemical stuff, but certainly everything's going to, to hell, we could speak. Uh, Steiner spoke of that in a sense, and I mean, I use Steiner stuff, I'm not totally into him as an adherent, but he came up with a lot of great ideas, and he had, he spoke of, you know, this was a time that Ariman, you know, the force of darkness was incarnating. And there's an interesting book I came across years ago, the co the computer and the incarnation of Ariman. And then we can look at like John Lilly's work, you know, the scientist that did the uh, early flotation tank work in the communication with dolphins, and you know, he spoke of like this uh, silicone intelligence that was like uh, you know posing the carbon intelligence and stuff. Um, and we, there's something coming with the artificial intelligence. This all ties in. I can only try to think of it in archetypal senses, right? Because going into the specifics of each one, you know, you have to get so deep into different aspects of the science. But you can see it happening everywhere. And we go back. Let's take a look at Tesla, right? What Tesla, you know, hundred over a hundred years ago, he developed a free energy system. He he was going to give it to the world for free at the uh, New York World's Fair in 1912. And that Warden Cliff Tower was going to broadcast free power to the world and he was building it so it would last like a thousand years but he was going to put like a backup station down in um, South Africa I think just to you know in case they ever had to do something this was non-electromagnetic and the um, it was magneto dielectric currents you know faster than light instantaneous it was ambient it would have been power was everywhere you didn't need to like run down wires or anything but the powers that be as um, my friend Jerry V used to call them, the desperate financiers, you know, they're almost like insects that rush. You know, something pops up that's good, and they, like, rush to, like, so if they can't get it and use it to manipulate the population, they suppress it, right? That's the whole history of the suppression of sciences. But what's interesting about this, um, I came across an article years ago on, on an Asian newspaper called Money, Power, and Modern Art. And it was all about how basically all these robber barons, the guys that you know suppressed Tesla and all these other people, they also changed the face of art. You know, they suppressed all the naturalistic arts and heavily funded the non-objective arts, which I actually quite like. But it was still interesting how this, the same people that manipulated, you know, society, the technology we get, everything, they also manipulated the structure of art. You know, there's, so there's very deep. And everything they do, all these like weird events that are pulled off, you know, the false flags and stuff, they're always timed with the stars. You know, these guys definitely know that science. And you were talking about like the Walmart culture, and it's true, it's pervasive. But behind that, right in front of our eyes, somebody's still building all the main like public buildings and things like that are all still being built in harmony with the stars and, and the earth grid. To this day, Washington, D.C. is like that. There's, there's a number of researchers that are, um, you know, looking at these various things. So somebody definitely knows what's up and is using that, and it could very well be the same people that are putting out all this other stuff to make us dumb. I but then agree. The question I agree. In fact, I've been writing a blog called Meg Rituals since 2012, and I've continued it in some variations along the way. But when you start to track that, and you start to track the esoteric symbolism in some of, some of those mainstream events, it becomes crystal clear that something somewhere it knows what it's doing, and it's, it's completely uh, mass brainwashing people to the point where it's almost like it's a of a spell would you agree oh absolutely and i've been 
watching. I mean, that's one of my interests is watching how the spell goes. So that's why I've been sort of watching all the different um, – because I'm interested in how the universe is put together. So I've been watching all these different groups, you know, the geocentrists, the concave earthers, the flat earthers, and just watching the progression of consciousness and ideas as they flow through all these different sort of groups and um, what information is being fed, what they believe. Somebody's definitely, they, they've got buildings full of people thinking this stuff up and what to put out there and, and how to... Um, yeah, basically what we call poneristic. I don't know if you're familiar with ponerism, right? Sort of the um, so somebody's definitely setting something up um, to create what we call characteropathic sort of reactions in people. You know, they're unnatural reactions. You know, people are now being swayed by meme think. You know, sort of like television. You know, we go back. I was talking about this with a friend the other night. We're looking back at shows like Magnum PI and stuff. I said, I couldn't watch that stuff. I said, because at the time, there'd always be stuff like, you know, a car would be coming at him, and the door would open to hit him, and he'd go rolling in the street. But he'd be rolling on the wrong side of the street, right, on the other side of the car. They like <laughs> they intentionally put this stuff all through. You go, go. At first, I thought they were just idiots. Then I realized, no, they're intentionally putting everything wrong on purpose. You know, so yeah, look that, at the, that's the... That's the first thing people think is this is some idiot who gets millions and millions of dollars to put out movies or shows. But what people don't realize, or when they do realize and they start researching on their own, that some of the funding and the way that shows and movies are produced and the funding that it, where it comes from is vastly interesting because it shows a trail. It leaves a little breadcrumb trail. And you start to realize that these people are getting millions of dollars to do these projects and then to put it together where just that happens, what you just described, someone falls out of a car and then the shot turns and suddenly they're rolling down the opposite side of the street and the first thing the viewer is going to do is either question that and say, what a bunch of, this is a cheap, you know, B-class movie or what a bunch of idiots who put this together. Um, but then you have the ones who maybe don't notice. Do you think that it's perhaps targeting, like, what is it targeting? What is it trying to get? Is it trying to get the subconscious? of a person's mind what's the purpose the the question that always comes to mind for myself and other people is why why are they doing that right well my, my answer is and i don't know if it's true or not but it makes sense to me is, is it, I, I believe we're at a point in time or in the time flows what i call the great bifurcation of souls right we're at the end of a precessional cycle there, there's major changes going on in the solar system on the planet and the sun the stuff's happening everywhere, and you look at all the, um, you know, what you call like the perennial philosophy. You know, it was really the 2012 stuff that sort of got me into this. Although I'd known about it earlier because I mentioned like Riley Crabb, he was into how we're at the end of the Platonic age and the coming of the age of Aquarius. But now we're able to actually define that sort of in a precise mathematical form uh, and the scientific form by monitoring the, the changes in the planets, you know, the energetic changes in the outer planets, vast changes like Jupiter's, you know, shifting its frequencies and, you know, so many things are happening like that. So it's, you know, but it's pervading down here. So if all these planets, everything's all influencing us, then it's influencing here. And somebody's obviously known probably for millennia hundreds of years at minimum because we look at stuff like the money sort of scams and stuff they've been running for hundreds of years and probably thousands so somebody's been riding these cosmic currents and doing it but we're going to pass let's take a look at like the cathedrals of northern france the notre dame cathedrals they're actually laid out on the ground over the northern france in the if you take this star map of the constellation virgo and lay it down there and just size it Virgo is laying on northern France. And, and now all those cathedrals, the Notre Dame cathedrals, were built on ancient uh, sacred sites, either little hills or springs. There were sacred sites to the Black Madonna of Space. It's like, well, who actually thought this up in the first place? Did somebody know this? How did these, you know, I could see, well, maybe somebody could have mapped it out geodetically and laid this on the ground. But how did the sacred hillocks and springs get there, you know, in the shape of, and how did somebody know it was there? Where is this connection? Where does the, you know, I, I'm not sure I have any answers. You know, that's why I say I'm, I'm not looking for the answer. I'm just trying to figure out how to better frame the question. Just trying to get as much information as I can. 
um, and keep what I call my spiritual orientation in the middle of it, right? It's a, as you get tumbled in life, you know, you mentioned that earlier, you know, everybody's seeking, everybody's seeking something, and um, the powers that be play on this. You know, they put sort of, they use sacred symbolism and things and pull people in, and then they put little things that just, like I was talking about the thing with the car, that'll only be like a one or two second flash. Most people don't notice it. It just goes right by, and, and the consciousness gets so used to seeing these incoherent patterns that they just don't notice. You know, you can, you can tell them anything. <laughs> and they just go for it. And then I believe that then certain memes are actually put. Go ahead. I'm are... sorry. I was going to ask. I was going to ask quickly. Just interject for a second. Is it a kind of programming? Oh, definitely, without a doubt. I mean, you look at sort of things like I don't want to pick on them, but the, the flat Earth sort of people. I mean, that's clearly somebody really thought that one out well that's very very clever the way that they actually play on perceptions and misuse of sort of information and stuff and yeah i swear to god there had been a team thought about that for a long time there's no way that, that one just sort of like erupted and went along you know, like i say you know you see the characteropathic changes in people you know if they had like good friends like you know shut me off and unfriend me on facebook and shut up you know they won't skype me anymore and stuff like that because you know, i won't accept that the earth is flat right they've got to, you know just just accept it you know go research it. i go i did research it you know um you know, here's my cosmographic evidence of it. You know, let's discuss this stuff. You know, here we're looking at celestial navigation. They go, oh, that doesn't work. They just made that up. I go, yes, it does. I talk to sailors and stuff. I'm going, geodetic surveying. They go, oh, no, they just make that up. They don't use it. I go, yeah, look, man, I'm talking to geodetic surveyors that use this stuff. This stuff's all available. They go, no, it's not. You just want to believe that. <laughs> Well, and then you realize, they into, yeah, they go into the whole uh, the illusion thing, and the it's a very very mysterious behavior. I believe it's it's just it doesn't make much sense. It's almost like it's a massive distraction for us to get lost in, in order for us, you know, to kind of forget that we're in such a potent and powerful time that we have really yes. as much opportunity available to us as we do conspiracy and mystery and and all of these things that little eddies that we can get caught into and oftentimes don't get to be able you know we don't pull ourselves out of them because we get consumed by them and uh, the flat earth theory you know I've, I've people email me and ask me and i sorry but i ignore the emails i don't respond i refuse to get caught up in the conversations uh i, I just think it's a massive just you know distraction right now and instead we should be focusing on other things that have more relevancy to the evolution of what we're really here to do is, is to ripen our consciousness and move into preparation for death you go back to talking about the tibetan book of the dead and death and and you know we're all headed there and that's just a matter of time and uh, you know the question is are we really prepared have we become a conscious person or have we got caught up in distraction and, and frivolousness and wasted our opportunities to learn and grow and, and i think when we get to the end or when that point happens we have a lot to do uh how we feel and whether people uh, one of the things that, that I'd like to talk, I mean, we're kind of, I, this hour is going by very fast, but one of the things I'd like to talk about, an example of this, is uh, Prince dying uh, recently, the iconic singer Prince and the Purple Rain phenomena that's happening because he actually changed his name to a symbol. Are you familiar with what's going on over here with that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I keep in touch with everything all over the world best I can. Um, I get like 20, 30 newsletters a day. You know, just scan through everything. Um, yeah, yeah, no, the Prince thing was actually quite interesting, you know, the way he changed his name to a symbol because of, the, you know, the battle with the forces that tried to take him over. And, uh, of course, you know, that was quite interesting. He started coming out, like, talking about chemtrails and, you know, stuff that you know, people should listen to Dick Gregory. I'm thinking, yeah, you know, the powers that be, they want to do that. And, I mean, but that all ties in with, like, this whole flat earth phenomenon and stuff is it, that's – it's the great bifurcation of souls. You know, the thing is, is there's things in the universe that are happening that we can't net generally grasp with our conscious minds. We only see sort of the effects of these things, and the, the symbolic nature of things is our relationship to them. Um, and I think probably what Prince thought 
you know, it, it appears he had a very you know, a talented man like that. He was probably extremely intelligent and was aware of a lot of things that he couldn't talk about. So just to even use a symbol like that, I always thought it was quite interesting in its sense. I, I always loved that idea. Even though I was never super into his music, it wasn't really my style of listening to. No, I didn't dislike it. I was just I was more into like avant-garde jazz and different things like that. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rambling. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I appreciate your insight. It's it is a phenomenon. I think it's also a mega ritual. I think they're turning it into an opportunity to plant the conscious mind uh, or the subconscious mind, excuse me. And I think that people are either going to get caught up in the the drama of it. Again, we go back to this kind of choice. Uh, I wrote an article recently about it being an opportunity to see it as it was perhaps presented you know he presented the symbol as a unification of male and female energies which of course is extremely alchemical and you know you have this as as above so below kind of phenomena happening with with what he's talking about with this and this unification of love and this symbol was meant to be uh, a love symbol which was published in people's magazine here in the united states for the may issue so now people are reading this issue and there's seeing this symbol as a symbol of love and now they're turning it into kind of a fad phenomenal type experience where people are getting a tattoo they're putting it on t-shirts so you're seeing a spread of an iconic symbol which they've labeled a love symbol I mean of course you have the writers and researchers who go on and on about the satanic stuff and the Illuminati and all of this very real information available online people are reading that do you think that when we get into these kinds of things what we choose to focus on whether it's the perspective of this being a love symbol versus this perspective of it being a satanic kind of thing or event does that actually lend our consciousness to those entities to those energies uh depending on which we focus on well symbols are a potent uh, activator of uh, the deeper consciousness i mentioned the tattvas earlier you know the uh, old uh, vedic elements and there's a practice called the tattva vision where you'll like stare at like the yellow square which is earth um for a while then you'll like move away and just stare at like you know blank wall as this thing you get the reactive image but you also it starts going into consciousness these things actually do trigger um sort of elemental fields within the consciousness so yeah i mean everything is it's it's all symbolic you know, as a, you know, Confucius said, signs and symbols rule the world, not words and laws. Um, they just use words and laws up front to keep you confused while they're flashing symbols at you. So I didn't realize about that with the Prince uh, thing happening with all the uh, people going for the symbol. But, but people ache for symbols. But then again, you'll get sort of like the um, very strict sort of Christians that anything, anything that's not a cross is like the devil stuff, right? Because you're not going along with what the preacher's saying and he's like making a living off you and stuff. Not to be too cynical, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that, we had another hour. We could get into that for sure. Um, I, I think that's a valid point because what, what, what do you think, I mean, quickly, what do you think about... That, that movement of the old religion consciousness versus the newer, uh, expanded, more sustainable co- consciousness that's sprouting and growing on this planet right now, how do you see the two of them interacting quickly? Oh, I see trouble ahead in that sense. I mean, I'm kind of come from the Gnostic school that, uh, you know, our, any salvation that we may experience is, can only come from within. There is no external savior. There are only external events which teach us. But they only teach us what we're willing to learn and what we put into it. So ultimately, the answer is us. We've got to deal with it ourselves. Mm. Um, Well, that's a good answer. Thank you so much. Thomas Joseph Brown, everybody. I hope you've been listening closely. And if not, please replay the archive, which will be available on my YouTube channel, YouTube slash Hillary Ramo. You can find it there and you can share it with your friends. Tom, where can people find you? If they'd like to know more about your work, what's the best way to contact you? Do they have questions? Um, yeah, well, there's a thomasbrown.org. Um, I have, or I've just set up a new Facebook page under my name, Thomas Joseph Brown. I just made it active. I haven't put too much on there because I'm just getting too many friend requests. I can't keep track of my regular page. So I've just started another page, which I'm going to start 
doing all my posting on. So that that's one way. And then I have a YouTube channel where, I mean, I've got documentaries going back into the 80s where we were showing, like, Tesla's faster than light electricity and stuff. So um, I'm really not that hard to find. And I'm happy to, happy to help anybody that's looking for information. You know, that's that's what life's about. I just enjoy good conversations. Well, I appreciate your, your candor, and I also appreciate your, your you have a kindness to you that is rare in some of these researchers I've found. It, it, you have a very openness about you, which is very welcome with this kind of information. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate your time, and, and it's been a pleasure. Oh, likewise, Hillary. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity just to have a great chat. You take care. Lots of love. Yeah. You've been listening to Yin Radio. I'm your host, Hillary Ramo. And until next time, everyone, namaste. Yeah.